and welcome to Arts Alive. This week we're at the International Slavery Museum for the launch of a special exhibition, Broken Lives, Slavery in Modern India. Stephen, uh, this exhibition, Broken Lives, can you tell us a bit, um, you're the curator, yeah. tell us a little bit how you've been working on it. Uh, yeah, well, the exhibition uh, Broken Lives uh, is about the Dal community in India uh, and how, um, through sort of historically, um, they've been situated at the bottom of society in India, um, and so they've been really restricted to sort of the most hazardous and dangerous jobs in society, um, and also uh, coupled with uh, a lack of education educational opportunities. Um, they're in today's uh, society very um, susceptible to um, trafficking and uh, bonded labour and um, sexual exploitation um, and other forms of uh, modern forms of slavery. Here at the International Slavery Museum um, most of the work is based around African slavery yeah. but with broken lives it shows that it's still happening today. Exactly right. Um, when the International Slave Museum opened, um, at the core, we do look at, um, as you say, the history of transatlantic slavery and Liverpool's role in that history and how it, it profited uh, from the trade. But from the museum's inception, we wanted to look at contemporary issues, human rights issues as well. So obviously for us, um, the place to start was looking at uh, modern forms of slavery and how it manifests itself and affects people in the, in the world today. Um, so in 2010 we opened the Campaign Zone uh, where we used that as a platform to highlight uh, contemporary forms of slavery. So we've had uh, a number of exhibitions since then um, and this one is focused on India um, basically because a lot of the statistics show that um, uh, although you can quote a lot of statistics, um, a lot of them point to the fact that at least half the world's uh, enslaved people today are in India. What can we find in this exhibition? There are pictures, there's a lot of things, there's objects as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the exhibition uh, is split into three main sections, uh, covering three, three uh, sort of main common forms of um, uh, modern slavery that you'll see um, Dalits um, uh, subjected to in India. So the first one is um, the brick kilns. Um, so you see how uh, Dalits um, are um, through a cycle of exploitation and poverty um, subjected to um, bonded labour and also child labour in the brick kilns. So you find out how and why that happens. Um, also there's a section on the Jagomi system in India. Uh, where girls as young as five are dedicated to the local village temple, uh, goddess. Um, and then you also find out about the um, textile industry and how young girls are lured, trafficked into the uh, textile industry and basically uh, promised um, lump sum um, cash payments at the end of a, a contract. Um, sometimes that can be from three to five years. Um, and quite often at the end of that contract um, they'll have received no money. That's after working 12-hour um, shifts uh, for six days a week. Um, so you find out how that happens and how you can um, sort of get involved to prevent it. But isn't it a little bit our responsibility as well in the Western world as consumers? Yeah, absolutely, uh, because a lot of the goods um, so for instance, um, the uh, young uh, girls who are caught in the textile industry, um, a lot of the goods they produce are aimed for European and UK markets, so it's really important and that's why we want uh, our businesses to get involved and sign up to um, campaigns like um, Make Fashion Traffic Free, uh, which is about um, consumers putting uh, pressure on uh, uh, retailers to find out who the suppliers are, because a lot of them don't know um, the details of how the suppliers treat their workers, so it's about retailers putting pressure on the suppliers to ensure that workers are not exploited and that they're paid the fair wage, that the um, um, places which they work are safe and hazard free. Um, so it's about trying to promote um, um, sort of ethical and fair um, labour practices within the textile industry. Now 
are with uh, Jeeva Kumar. Hello. Hi. Uh, you are director of Practigya India. That's Can you tell right. us uh, what, what it is? Uh, we are an NGO, a Christian NGO that's based in uh, India. Uh, but we have our partners here, the Dalit Freedom Network mm -hmm. in the UK that works alongside us in bring, bringing freedom to the Dalits of our nation. Can you tell us who are the Dalit people? Uh, the Dalits are the ones that have been uh, branded as impure from the moment they are born. There are about uh, 300 million of them in our country and they are the outcasts of our country. They've you know, been untouchables, uh, they've been considered untouchables over the years and uh, they suffer a lot of discrimination till this day. What do you mean by untouchable? Okay, untouchability was banned by our country, you know, and our constitution in 1950, but it's still in existence. And, uh, you know, these Dalits are considered untouchables uh, because they do the most toughest and menial jobs that are considered polluting by the other castes of our country. Okay, so um, can you tell us maybe why they are uh, the people the most uh, subject to slavery then? Okay, so 90% of those that are trafficked are from the Dalit community because they are the most vulnerable. They've been considered outcasts. They're considered as subhumans in our country. And so, uh, you know, they're the ones that uh, are pushed into this sort of a crime. So you've been working with the International Slavery Museum for this exhibition. Um, it's divided in several parts. We have uh, stories from people. We have details about, for instance, the Jogini. Uh, can, maybe can you tell us a bit about this? Okay. Uh, the Jogini system uh, is a system where young girls are dedicated to a goddess uh, when they are small, say around the age of five. And then when they hit puberty, they are used by the local community. And once they are supposedly married off to the goddess, thereafter she does not get married to a man. And uh, she uh, can be used by anyone in that village because she's been told that service done unto these men is service done unto God. The cry of every Jogini is that, you know, everybody uh, uses us, but, you know, nobody marries us and everybody embraces us, you know, but nobody protects us. And it's a really harsh life for these uh, women, you know, because uh, they are obliged to satisfy the lustful desires of the men and they can make no demands because it's an obligation on their part once they're dedicated as a jogani to service, service these men as and when you know, they ask for it. But what about the people around the population? Nobody says nothing about it? It's actually illegal. In 1988, it was made illegal, uh, but it's still being practiced. And uh, a recent survey done in the state that I come from, which is Andhra Pradesh, uh, a one-man commission was appointed by the state government uh, to really do uh, extensive research to find out how many Joganis are there. And he found that there were 80,000 Joganis just in that one state. So it's still being practiced. And uh, it's, it's a superstitious belief by the people there that you know, they're doing a noble thing. Yeah. And uh, so they keep pushing the vulnerable women to keep dedicating their daughters again and again. The good thing is the government recognizes that there's a problem yeah. and that we're not alone and uh, we're working alongside the government uh, to dismantle the system and hopefully we will be able to dismantle the system pretty soon uh, because, uh, you know, the law says that it is illegal and uh, we are using our lawyers, we're working with the police, we're working with the Joganis themselves uh, to highlight the illegality of this program, uh, the whole dedications. And so we are seeing breakthroughs and uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring an end to this practice. Can you explain us what is bonded labor? Okay, uh, again, uh, you see a lot of uh, bonded labor in our country, especially amongst the informal sector where uh, people are employed by brick kilns and uh, you know, they don't 
come under the government oversight because you know they're working in the informal sector and so you know they are really abused and uh, they've been brought in to work after they've taken a small amount of money which they will never ever be able to repay so it's like the whole family is involved in brick kilns and uh, you know in bonded labor for years and years together and uh, it's actually again you know there's a constitutional ban the you know article 21 and 23 of the constitution says uh, bonded labor has been banned but you know it's still being practiced in many countries in many companies like the br brick kilns and again, the cotton mills, you know, you'll be seeing, uh, you know, the work in the cotton mills where girls are being exploited, young girls. So this is not just bonded labor, but again, child labor is involved in our country to a huge extent. And uh, we have the dubious distinction of hosting the largest number of child laborers in our country. Now, there's close to about 4.35 million child laborers from the age back bracket of 5 to 14. And uh, again, these young girls are, you know, brought into the cotton mills and uh, they are promised huge amounts of money, like a bonus at the end of their term. You know, and these girls are drawn into it. Their parents are drawn into it because, you know, we have this whole dowry system in our uh, country where you have to give a gift when you get married yes. to the husband's side. So they think that, you know, if the girl works in this company and she receives the bonus, they can give the bonus as a dowry. But in reality, it doesn't happen. These girls are usually terminated before they end their, uh, you know, contract or uh, they're exploited so much during their time of employment that many of them don't even come to the very end of their term of uh, you know service mm -hmm. so they go away being sick or you know just being tired of the whole thing so you know again they're being uh, uh, cheated you know and uh, robbed of their childhood okay. um so you, you uh, you're, you're working with the Dalit Freedom Network, but uh, in India, how how do you help? What are the actions that you are working on to try and prevent this this bonded labor and uh, help the Joginis as well? I basically work with the anti-human trafficking department, which uh, the Dalit Freedom Network uh, supports, and. Uh, where the Joganis are concerned, we work with them, we empower the Joganis themselves and uh, help them raise awareness about the illegality of the, prog uh, of the practice in their villages. You know, who better to go and tell the women, the Joganis, that this is a system uh, that abuses women and children, the Joganis themselves. Yeah. So they go and do that. They advocate on, on behalf of the Joganis. And uh, we run uh, schools in these areas for them. And uh, we also do a lot of advocacy on their behalf. And you were saying as well that you have the support of your government, of local institutions. Yes. Uh, See, the, the whole problem of human trafficking is that, you know, no country is immune to human trafficking, absolutely. And there was a recent UN report uh, which says that much more has to be done to deal with this problem. And it's there all over the world. It's happening in Europe as well. So absolutely. But the problem with India is that we are so huge, we have a huge population and, uh, you know, tremendous diversity and our status as a developing country doesn't really help and makes the problem yes. worse. And uh, that's why we are trying to galvanize as much support as we can uh, to bring awareness uh, about the problem of the Dalits mm -hmm. and to raise enough support and resources uh, to bring freedom to these, uh, the people called Dalits. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Broken Life Slavery in Modern India will be on display at the International Slavery Museum until the 24th of April 2016. After the break on Utter Life, we travel from India to the Nordic territories with Sylvia Eikin's exhibition called Coastlines.
back to Art to Live. I'm at the Williamson Art Gallery in Birkenhead with Sylvia Hykins to talk to her about her new show, Cold Coastlines. Now, Sylvia, I've known you on and off a very long time, and I remember you as somebody who worked in the health industry, as a writer, as a publisher, and a musician. Is painting something new for you? Not really, Chris. Um, many, many moons ago, I actually had a place at Liverpool Arts College, um, but I had two young children and decided, oh, I probably couldn't support them uh, being an artist, so I took an English degree instead. I've always kept painting, drawing the kids, that kind of stuff, and um, as when the kids left the nest and I had more time, I picked it all up again, and hence this. So, uh, did anything particular prompt that? I mean, you obviously, you've your, your paintings here about Iceland and the Wirral and the Vikings and so on, was there something that particularly spurred that? Well, yes. I mean, I was, I was painting abstracts and life drawing, and then by pure chance I went to Iceland in 2009 and totally fell in love with the place. I felt as if I'd lived there before. It was a most odd experience. I came straight back, started to write profusely, staying up all night and painting, um, and I had very quickly got a number of canvases and a friend of mine visited and said, you've got to do something about this, Sylvia. They're great. You don't see it yourself, do you? Um, and she contacted the Liverpool Nordic Church and that was where my first exhibition took place. And since then I have uh, I've got very engaged with the Nordic Church. I am now a director down there. Um, but um, I've been back to Iceland, well, when I go in July this year, it'll be my 14th trip. I have many friends, I've done poetry readings, I had an exhibition in Reykjavik and so on, and it's just like Topsy, grown and grown. <laughs> what are the resonances then between Iceland and Wirral? Huge, not just Wirral, but the northwest up to Cumbria, because the um, original Icelanders, who were Norwegians, renegade Norwegians, eventually came down to, um, a thousand years ago, uh, to Ireland, then across to, they were kicked out, across to the Isle of Man, came across to an empty Wirral, got permission from the Queen at Chester to settle there. Um, and so 1,000 years ago, if we were conducting this interview, we'd be speaking Old Norse, which is the language of the Icelanders today. So it's fascinating, and all our place names show this, Thingworth, Thingvedder in Iceland, Thingwar here, which is where the Parliament was, West Kirby, Vestry Kirkubaya, West by the Church. Yeah. It's all over the place. The, the names tell the history. It's all those end, words ending in BY, I think, like Kensby and Irving. It and, is, yeah. that's right, yes, yes. So, and so there's lots of, uh, there's lots of uh, place names and evidences of the Vikings being here. And you can still feel them. Well, I can still feel them anyway. I'm not sure about you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I mean, there was a big battle at Bromborough, the last well, great battle. It's, I mean, I believe it did take place in Bromborough. Of course, it is contested, but it's a lot, a lot of it adds up. Um, yes, and it was the big showdown, really, because, um, you know, the Vikings became a bit too big for their boots and wanted more territory, and there was a big showdown, and they lost. Um, I and in fact, um, one of the sagas, Eil Saga, Eil Scala Grimson, fought in the Battle of Bromborough and went back to Iceland, and his story is in the saga, and so the battle is mentioned. So tell us a bit about the paintings themselves then. You, you have a particular theory for the way you approach your painting, am I right? Well, first of all, I don't believe painting is a separate form of art. Um, I do believe that art is integrated. It's how we look at the world, how we feel the world around us, whether we do it by music, songs, spoken word, or visually, and it's all integrated. Um, so I don't believe in being an expert in one thing. Mix them all up, go for it. But these particular paintings, when I'm sitting in my little room with Radio 4 on, <laughs> Am I allowed to mention that? Um, and painting, I'm back in Iceland. I'm back in the landscape, you know, that I love. Um, and that is the resonance. I mean, the, the landscape of Iceland is extraordinary. Um, the, it has a tectonic plate running right through the middle. That plate is pulling apart. So all the time there's, there's fissure, volcanic eruptions going on. And in fact, I was in Iceland in 2010 when I had the Lyukut. And I have to say, when I said that in Iceland, I got a round of applause because very few people could pronounce it. Um, uh, it erupted. It was the, the one that caused the big ash cloud. Mm. Um, and I managed, myself and one other person, managed to find a completely lunatic retired Lufthansa pilot who flew us over the erupting volcano in his tiny Cessna. 
Uh, was not that not indeed quite a lunatic thing to do? It was a very lunatic thing to do. In fact, the next day, it, the government banned anyone flying over the volcano at all. But it was incredibly exciting. You were blown around like a moth. I thought my camera was going to be destroyed. My boots got hot. It took me about four days to get over a sore throat. But it was the most thrilling thing to do. And what you did was to get the forces of nature. And I think when you're in an Icelandic landscape, as with any wilderness, you realise that we have to keep some wilderness to survive that without wilderness, the earth cannot survive. That's my view. And this landscape here of glaciers and glacial water and scree slopes and volcanic slopes, how long is that ice going to be with us? Is it just our generation that will see it or not? So there's also this terrible feeling of fear when you're amongst it, fear of nature and the forces of nature and the fear that we won't learn to live with her. We will want to always conquer her. And if we try to do that, we're toast. <laughs> you, you've talked about being on a fault line and the fear of uh, eruptions from the volcanoes. But is, is global warming also a big issue up there? I mean, the melting of the polar ice caps, all that kind of stuff? Oh, absolutely. Um, of course, in terms of Iceland, it means they'll have a slightly warmer climate. <laughs> so it's, it's not all bad for Iceland. But of course, in the long run, it's bad for the Earth. And uh, the real fear, of course, I think, is the drilling in the Arctic for oil and uh, the effect that that will have um, on both pollution and animal life. Tell us a bit about your technique. You were telling me earlier a bit, a bit about the way you approach skies. Well, I think it's an advantage I didn't go to art school because I don't approach painting in a conventional way. Um, so, for example, when I'm painting, I try to think of the forces behind the painting. So if I'm painting rocks, I think of the molten lava that's underneath, the way the rocks are moving. And when I'm painting skies, it's just water vapor. So you can't paint a cloud like that. You have to, it's water vapor. So I turn the canvas upside down, plonk a bit of color on, get a great big brush full of turps, close my eyes, imagine the sky, and paint it on that empty canvas. Open my eyes, whatever's there, put it on the easel, finish it off with my hands. With your hands? Yeah, with my hands, So, because you keep it fluid. You don't do the detail. Then when I paint the landscape, big brushes and then tiny, tiny brushes to bring out the details. So. Fascinating talking to you. We're going to have a look around the exhibition now anyway, but just to, for people watching, there's going to be a, you're going to be giving a talk on the 11th of July, you know, which am. we're going to enlarge on all this. I hope so, and I hope to show some photographs of Iceland so you get some feel of what it's like. And I'm going to take people around, and I hope they'll enjoy what I have to say. Sylvia, thank you so much. Lovely to talk to you. That's it for Arts Alive this week. Join us again next time.